Good evening, everybody. Coming live to do a quick video. I know it's a bit late, but you know what? Again, I figure if some people can record videos in the wee hours of the morning, then, you know, this is not too late or too bad. So I'm curious who is listening, who is watching at this particular time. I really want to be intentional, Lord help me, that this would not be a long video, but I do hope it'll be a constructive video. So greetings, everybody. Uh, this video is really a follow-up to a few of the posts I've had on Facebook. It's a follow-up to the post I had on the, um, you know, kind of, kind of four of the greatest dangers to Christianity right now. So I, I, I want to do what I can from my mistakes. Listen, I've made a lot of mistakes in the prophetic, in hearing and transmitting what the Holy Spirit is saying. I don't want to just talk about prophecy, prophet, prophetic stuff, because a lot of people might be like, well, that's not me. I want to talk about hearing God's voice, being able to hear it correctly, being able to actually translate what the Holy Spirit is saying, not through, I mean, there, there are a bunch of lenses through which we can try to communicate what God is saying, and they're bad. And you know what's interesting? Even if the content is correct, then how we deliver something or the lens through which a prophetic word, a word of the Lord, spiritual intel information, if the lens is wrong, then even something that has a lot of seeds of truth, I'm not just talking about a little teeny bit of seed of truth, something that is full of truth, 95% truth could be rejected, could not be, it may not be received well because of how it's being presented. Now listen, I am not encouraging us to go down the politically correct route that is horrible. All that will do, when I say politically correct in the context of the local church, in the context of Christianity, it's like, well, God is telling me this, but I'm going to manipulate what God is saying. I'm going to change what God is saying. First and foremost, I see this done with scripture. I'm not going to go here tonight because this is not really where I want to focus the emphasis, but I see this in sometimes how people present or preach. Oh, I feel the presence of the Lord on this. Do you know why? We don't need to apologize for what's written in the Bible. We don't need to apologize. We need to preach grace 100% and truth 100%. We need to deliver truth with grace. But we do not for a moment need to apologize with what's written in the scriptures. I think we can have constructive conversation about it. But even as I'm, I was kind of thinking through, pondering through some of the Facebook responses and stuff to the, the, you know, the four things I identified as threats to Christianity in the 21st century, I'm like, you know what? Everybody, listen, I believe in free speech, so everybody is entitled to believe what they believe and express what they believe, okay? But if you're going to call yourself a believer, if we're going to call ourselves Christians, followers of Jesus, then I really believe we need to come to some similar conclusion. We need to come to conclusions on is the Bible accurate or not? And at the end of the day, I'll be honest, I'm 36 years old. I don't want to look to a 36-year-old for some sort of authority, on what scripture says. I don't want to look to, you know, to somebody younger than myself. I don't want to look to somebody who is going through some process of deconstructing or reconstructing their faith and be like, oh, what, you know what, because this person's on a journey and the journey might be positive, and the journey might be leading them straight to hell. I don't want to look at somebody's journey and we need to help people through their journey. Can I just say that? We need to help people through these journeys. We don't need to write them off. We don't need to be nasty to them. God, help me. Like, help me as we navigate these sensitive things, these sensitive topics. But these topics, there are certain things, folks, that are black and white. There are certain things that are right and wrong. There are certain things that that's sin and that's righteousness. There are certain things that the scripture clearly says, thou shalt not. And there are certain things, obviously, that the scripture says, thou shalt do. So at the end of the day, I want us to be very careful on that. And we need to identify what, you know, we don't need to make apologies for the scriptures. So anyway, I do believe though in healthy conversation about this and that's what we need to do. But we need to get some things straight. But that's not where I'm going in this conversation this evening. What I want to do is I want to talk about three incorrect lenses through which we can prophesy. And I might just share this very briefly and talk a little bit more about this uh, in, in the days to come, because it's been a long day. But Holy Spirit speaks to us. I believe we all have the ability to be prophetic, whether you are in the office of a prophet or you're a believer who is filled with the Holy Spirit. We all have the ability to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit, okay? And Scripture does have the final word. I agree with you 100% on that. Every kind of prophetic word needs to be measured next to the uh, 
the, the measuring rod of, of Scripture. So I'm not, I'm not even going there tonight. Well, let's just assume that the words the Holy Spirit is giving us measure up to Scripture, okay? Here, let me, let me just share. I, throughout my 20 years, because this year it's been 20 years of, I've been in the kingdom, 20 years that I've been saved, following Jesus, a disciple, whatever we're gonna, language we're going we're gonna to use. 20 years ago in July, this month, I encountered the Holy Spirit in a powerful way. Christ Fellowship Church, Palm Beach Gardens, Florida. I got to touch the Holy Spirit. Very subtle. You know, no fireworks. I didn't fall, shake, and rattle, roll. Although I've done that since. <laughs> but I had a powerful encounter with the Lord where I knew He's real. And if, he's indeed, if He is indeed real, if God is indeed real, this is why I'm such a, this is why I'm very celebratory towards revival and the move of the Holy Spirit and people get touched and, you know, manifestations of the Spirit. I don't, I don't tolerate those things. I celebrate them. Why? Because I think to myself, as somebody is there on the ground, whether they're shaking, laughing, weeping, trembling, I think to myself, that could be another me. That could be somebody like me when I was 16 years old, where my great question was, listen, I had a lot of theological information. I had a lot of Bible teaching. I went to a Christian school. I mean, all of my life I went to a Christian school from kindergarten to 12th grade. So this was around my 10th grade, 11th grade year. I had a lot of Bible information. I believed in God. I believed in Jesus, okay? But I didn't know he was real in the sense that he was near. He was probably out there somewhere. He might have wound the whole thing up as like the cosmic clockmaker type of scenario and let it all go. I didn't know that he was the God of Isaiah 64, one who rend the heavens, who actually tore open the heavens, came down, and that we could experience as a real person. So like I said, that's why I don't tolerate manifestations of the Holy Spirit. I celebrate them. And you know what? If people are acting goofy, weird stuff, deal with it. We deal with it. But I look and I see the person, like I said, on the ground at the altar, trembling, shaking, laughing, genuinely encountering the presence of God. And I think to myself, that was me when I was 16 years old being touched by God. And we must celebrate that. We must give space to that. So, so since then, I have been on a quest of learning how to hear, decipher, decode, whatever language we're going to use, the voice of the Holy Spirit. But you know what? It's not just about content. It's about character. It's not just the information or the intel that we get from the Lord. I believe it's also how we deliver it. And I, I, I want to share what I call some of my, I have three prophetic fails that I want to share, okay? Now, when I say this, these are not necessarily specific instances. They're, they're specific, I, I, because I can't remember all the details. And believe me, I've had far more than three, okay? We just need to be honest about when we succeed, and when we're honest, when we fail. Why? Because I never want to present information as somebody who believes they have a monopoly on hearing the voice of the Holy Spirit. When, you, when somebody presents themselves as being the exclusive voice or the exclusive ear to which the Holy Spirit speaks and through which the Holy Spirit is speaking. If somebody is claiming a prophetic monopoly on hearing God, in other words, everybody else is hearing wrong, I'm the only one who's hearing right, run, be concerned. See who this person is legitimately aligned with. And I'm not talking about, well, I'm aligned with apostle so-and-so and prophet so-and-so. And ju- no, no, who are they? Ju- and, and, you know, okay, well, apostle so-and-so and prophet so-and-so. You might never have heard. They might be hole in the ground, people. Who legitimately, with a track record of integrity, is this person aligned with? That is dangerous. I'm not going there tonight either. That's a whole other subject. All of these are so multifaceted. But here, the three prophetic fails that I had. Okay, and these are three incorrect lenses through which I have tried to communicate revelation. I believe, I'm not going to say all the revelation was accurate. I believe a good portion of it was, okay? So join with me. Hey, Scott, before I dive on in, I'm going to share my three prophetic fails tonight. And you know who I, you know who I so admire for doing the Sean Bowles? I think it was in his book, either Translating God or God's Secrets. Two amazing books. Um, where he so transparently and honestly shares about when he misses it. Listen, we miss it. We are in the New Testament. Praise God. Praise God that New Testament prophets are not responsible for the canonization of Scripture. Praise God. I mean, if any prophet, I feel like I'm saying just some things tonight that the Holy Ghost is just saying, uh, and he just wants us all to know. No New Testament prophet should ever claim, hey, Jermaine, they should never claim that they are somehow adding to or 
adding on to Scripture. No New Covenant, New Testament, quote-unquote, prophet or prophetic voice has any ability or authority to continue the canon of Scripture. That is where I would agree with my more evangelical brothers and sisters, somebody like a John MacArthur, who has high level of skepticism. Now, I, I staunchly disagree and repudiate some of the other stuff he says about the charismatic community. But I know the concerns in that camp the concern in that camp is any prophet, prophetic voice who is adding to Scripture, who would dare tamper with the Word of God, who would dare say that their words or revelations or information or intel that they're receiving from, quote-unquote, the Holy Spirit, adds to, subtracts from, or questions that which is established Scripture. Run away from that big time. That is scary. That is heretical. That is not a prophet. That is not a prophetic voice. That is somebody who needs to be confronted and dealt with. <laughs> But I'm not going there tonight. But I thought that was worth noting, okay? Because we're talk we want to talk through prophetic because at the end of the day, you know what my heart's desire is? I want all of us to go to the next level in the prophetic. What does that look like? Can I be to totally transparent? I I'm just wait I I nice to see you guys on. I, I want to share these these lessons because I think they're gonna help us. But the next level in the prophetic, that's the only reason I'm sharing this stuff. You know, this is, I don't want to just share Larry's blooper reel where it's like, well, Larry really messed up here. It's all got to be constructive. We need to share successes and failures. But when we share, when I, I feel the Holy Spirit saying this, when you share your failures, because sometimes actually it's almost like people gloat in their failures. Does that make sense? It's almost like, well, false humility. They share their their failures packaged in false humility where it's like, well, I just did this really bad. No, no, no. Share your failure to be redemptive and constructive to help the people that you're talking to avoid the failure or the pitfall that you went through. Does that make sense? I'm not sharing this, oh, oh, well, woe me, poor me, the Eeyore anointing or something. No, I want to share this so that you don't have to make the same mistakes that I did. Or at least if you're in the process of navigating or dealing with these mistakes, then praise God, I hope that this will give you some sort of clarity on how to get out or recognize it, okay? <clears throat> so, three prophetic fails. And these correlate to these three bad lenses, okay? Three false lenses that through which we're trying to deliver probably accurate prophetic information. Number one, the lens of offense, okay? Lens of offense. Man, oh, I, I remember my first paper. Yes, my first paper for Regent University when I was getting my Master of Divinity. <laughs> and this was, very, this was 2010, so I was still, I was, this was about two plus years after leaving a very destructive church environment. Listen, can I be totally transparent, totally honest? At that particular time in my life, I mean, I had undergone counseling, inner healing type of stuff, leaving this church that was just extremely unhealthy. You've heard of hyper grace. This was a hyper faith church, okay? I believe in the word of faith message. Listen, Destiny Image, we are also parent company for Harrison House. But I can't tell you how many of those books were fundamental and foundational in my... I'm not talking about some of the nonsense out there. I'm not talking about the people... I'm just saying, in terms of legitimate Bible teaching on how to confess and declare the Word of God, not to get a Lamborghini, not to get an Armani suit, but to actually see the Word of God work. I think of God's Creative Power by Charles Capps. I think of Authority in Three Worlds. All of Charles Capps' stuff is amazing, Okay. Obviously, you just use discernment going through that stuff. But the, the point I'm trying to make is a lot of those things were foundational in my life, okay? But what happened is I wanted to throw the baby out with the bathwater. I went through this extremely bad church situation. I was there five, six years, kind of on and off because I was like, there's something fishy here. But that's not the point of that. I've, I've talked about that whole deliverance situation in the whole video that I did with Jennifer LeClaire on Jezebel. So if you're dealing with, if you're dealing with like a Jezebel cultish type of church situation. You can go listen to that. But here's the point. I left there about three years. I had things. In my, I had a heart of offense toward the leadership. I had a, but you know what? As a result of, well, not, number one, having a heart of offense toward that, le the, that particular leader was wrong. Okay. It was wrong of me to have unforgiveness, bitterness, man, I was a mess. But do you know what that did? I allowed a heart of offense and bitterness towards a leader to contaminate that whole movement. So in other words, I this, this person led a church, they pastored a church that one would consider a word of faith type of church, but it was a very hyper-imbalanced faith church, okay? 
But that didn't matter because I allowed my offense and bitterness to completely taint how I saw that entire movement. So you know what I did for my Regent, Regent University, my first Master of Divinity paper? I was putting together this whole treatise on the imbalance of not just the prosperity gospel, because I repudiate the prosperity gospel. I completely disagree with that. I stand against that. But on how all word of faith teaching is, is detrimental and dangerous. And I was using Christianity in Crisis, which is Hank Hangraff's book, as my like one of my key uh, sole references. Can I just make a, uh, here's the bottom line. I wanted to legitimate, I wanted to deal with some legitimate error, because there is legitimate error there. There's legitimate error, I believe, in every expression or flow or flavor of the charismatic community. And guess what? There is legitimate error in all of the different denominations, okay? I wanted to deal with legitimate error, and praise God for people like Dr. Michael Brown and stuff who have dealt with it and continue to do so. I was not dealing with it in a constructive way. Do you know how you know? You know how I can tell you one way I identified that I was addressing something out of a wrong lens. I was dealing with some legitimate issues. There were some legitimate issues there, but I did not provide any redemptive or constructive solutions. All it was was a hate piece. Does that make sense? All it was was bashing. All it was was negative. All it was was against. I'm against the word of faith. All the prosperity. It was blanket statement after blanket statement. I rejected the entire movement because I dealt with one instance of a completely berserk, ridiculous scenario. And I allowed that. I allowed bitterness and offense to completely poison how I observed and engaged an entire, I believe, a legitimate uh, movement in the body of Christ that in some areas has gotten off really far and I believe it needs to be construct uh, I need to believe I believe it needs to be confronted dealt with but does that make sense so when you deliver prophetic words through that um, lens of offense your word is being motivated by bitterness your word your you might have legitimate, listen, legitimate content that you are receiving from the Holy Spirit. But if your content is being delivered in a character or a tone that does not reflect the Lord, and also all it does is put something down without giving, I'm not even talking, listen, I'm not talking about, well, every word needs to be building people up. Every word needs to be encouraging people. No, because some some situations, some people, some instances and circumstances demand a hard word. They demand a confrontational word. But God is a God, even with conviction, okay? The devil works in condemnation. So condemnation just reminds you of how bad you are, how hopeless your situation is, how there's no way you can get out of whatever you're dealing with. Conviction is the opposite. Conviction is a legitimate work of the Spirit. How do you know if it's conviction? Easy. Can, Holy Spirit does shine that probing light on sin and areas of our lives that obviously are an issue. But guess what? With that light of conviction always comes hope, always comes a revelation that the power of God inside of you through the person of the Holy Spirit has the ability, has the energy, that, divine, that laboring with the divine energy, the divine grace, the divine power of God is inside of you to give you the victory over the things that the Holy Spirit is highlighting with that wonderful spotlight called conviction. In the same way, when we deliver a prophetic word and we're dealing with stuff, we're confronting stuff. We're calling stuff out. We need to make sure, number one, we are not delivering that word in through a lens of offense. But also, we need to make sure that even if it's hard, even if it's harsh, and listen, it's not all chocolate cupcakes and yellow sprinkles. If it's hard, my prayer is that we would, we would seek the Lord. God, what I share, may I present a solution. May I present a solution. I think that's going to be kind of the common denominator for all three of these bad lenses. We need to deliver God's redemptive solution. If he's dealing with something, you read throughout, I mean, throughout major and minor prophets, God deals with stuff. The prophets deal with stuff. They deal with stuff. And some people are like, well, that was the Old Testament prophets. Listen, I think of people like Agabus. I think, I mean, he had a warning word. Listen, prophecy is not all you're awesome. But here's the deal. It's not all you're awful. It can say, it, prophecy could be somewhere in the middle where it's like, this is awful. 
this is bad, this is hurting you, this is harming the church, this is something that is warring or working against your nation or region, but here's the solution from God, because at the end of the day, I don't need a prophet to tell me the problem, although, you know what, maybe we do need a prophet to tell us the problem, because we, we have these itching ears who want to hear peace, peace. We do need somebody to tell us the problem. But I'm not entirely impressed when somebody just calls out the problem. I'm very impressed when they call it the problem and they also release the supernatural divine solution that will actually give somebody or a church or a nation or that will release a strategy into the earth to actually reverse the problem. And God, time after time, I'm, t- I'm talking in the Old Testament context, time after time, God would release and reveal a strategy. And you know what? It was often the same thing over and over again. Repent and turn back to me. Repent and turn back to me. But guess what? That's an age-old solution on how to respond to a confrontational or warning word or something like that. Is to seek the Lord. Repent. Turn back to Him. So number one, through the lens of offense. And these, yeah, I'm doing my best to share this. But yeah, I, I, man, I, I was so offended by that person, by that pastor by that church and by the grace of God it took the Holy Spirit and a lot of years for me to navigate that but there's healing there um, so now yeah I can point out some of the issues and some of the problems but I also want to call forth the positive things I want to call forth the things that we need to cultivate that are good solid and strong anyway number one is offense number two is anger and, and, and I've shared this with John and Carol Arnett but so as I was going through this period of, I'm so grateful for seminary, so grateful for Regent University because the Lord used those five years um, to really mature me, to confront me and mature me, to confront me with a lot of bitterness, uh, anger, and self-righteousness that I had, and to and, and just cultivate the appropriate character inside of me. And again, not perfect, hello, but... Um, I saw the Lord did a lot of work in those five years. Uh, well, when I say a lot of work, he, he raised, he brought a lot to my attention. Let's just say that. Number two, prophesying through anger. What's the, well, offense is when there's unresolved bitterness, unresolved um, unforgiveness, that type of thing. Anger is where you just don't like something or you don't like somebody, okay? Or, do, and you know why often I kept, I kept thinking about this, but I didn't add it as a category. Often, the anger that I experience, and number two is prophesying through anger, a lens of anger. I, I would literally write and speak against the Toronto blessing. Um, I'm going to share this completely transparently because I think this is very helpful and healthy. But 2008, as many of us know, there was a movement in Lakeland, Florida called the Lakeland Revival Florida outpouring all that. Um, I remember, I'll, I'll just share what I experienced there very briefly. I went there 2008. Um, I'll never forget, though, we went there, me, my wife, and Kyle Winkler. And uh, what a pow- powerful worship. Roy Fields, Catherine Mullins. I mean, the worship there was off the charts. The hunger for God, off the charts. Legitimate. The worship was pure. Beautiful presence of God. Uh, hunger for God from thousands, thousands of people throughout the nations. Pure. Um, but I'll be honest, okay? And, and I'm just, this is as far as I'm going to go. I got very offended. Now, I was coming off a fence from my previous church situation, so that didn't help. Uh, and at, at this point, just because of how the Lakeland thing ended up turning out, and if you don't know how that all turned out, I, I, I really don't want to go into there because, again, a lot of this is not all that constructive. It just ended very poorly. And wouldn't you know it, that didn't make me just... that I already had a fence that I was dealing with. But now I was like, man, I don't want any of this charismatic stuff. I want nothing to do with this whole movement. It's crazy, although I know God is real and I know God moves in the gifts of the Spirit. So believe me, I was working in a very interesting mental conundrum. But what happened was this, is that I did not like, I did not like what was happening. I was like, this is absolutely goofy. This is ridiculous. Um, And then so anything that looked or sounded like some of the manifestations or the happenings or the phenomena that was taking place during the Lakeland revival, I I just started to, I, I wasn't offended, but I was mad. So I remember writing papers about, well, I believe this revival, this one, these particular revivals were legitimate, but this Toronto stuff with this laughter, you know, I didn't understand it. Can I be honest? I didn't understand what now I would call holy laughter. I didn't understand some of the jerking manifestations or how, now some of that is obviously goofy in the sense that people make it up, people manufacture it. I've seen it. I've facilitated tens of dozens of meetings like this where we have seen that. 
We have seen people do some very bizarre things. But guess what? I have seen the pure. I've seen people legitimately get, I just feel it now. I, I'll never forget one of the last meetings. It was with John and Carol Arnett. I'll go back into my issue, my problem, my prophetic fail in a minute. But um, the point is here, I was mad at some of that stuff because I didn't understand it. Does that make sense? I was mad at when people acted a certain way when they claimed that the Holy Spirit touched them. I didn't understand. I guess you could lump it in with offense, but, uh, but here, here it was mad. And as a result, I remember writing papers. Um, praise God, God did not allow me in any major uh, public arenas to prophesy during that period of time. Be grateful, be grateful, my friends, for the seasons where you are restless. I feel this is a word of the Lord right now. Be grateful for seasons where you are restless. I just read somebody who wrote a wonderful post about this, where they said something like, you know, in their 20s, I'm glad God didn't really give me forget who it is. Now it's going to bother me because <laughs> they were just a great person. They were a great person, but they're like, I'm grateful in my twenties that the Lord really didn't give me, um, a, a microphone. Oh, it's my friend, Chris Sheely, worship leader at, uh, catch the fire up in Raleigh saying, I'm grateful in my twenties. I didn't have a mic because obviously we're in process and you know, God will give young people. I'm not saying that he won't give a young person a platform, but during that period of my life, God I think was intentionally keeping me hidden. Do you know why? I had a lot of anger. I had a lot of offense. I had anger. If he would have, I mean, I would have messed, I would have prematurely messed up relationships that I have today with people who I love, people who have truly blessed me, spoken into my life more than anybody else. Truly, absolutely. John and Carol Arnett, John Kilpatrick, these people to me, are cream of the crop. They're top notch. These are people whose lives, I mean, I've, I, I, would I call them my best friends in the world? No, I've just been fortunate to sit down with them, to, to dine with them, to talk with them, to listen with them, to, 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 to listen more than anything, to listen to what they have to say. They have become people that I have undying respect for. And these are the people I criticized. Why? Because I was anger. I was angry. Surely these kinds of, this phenomenon is not from God. And uh, I repent for that. I mean, I've, I've repented several times, but I'm like, God, and it, it helps me not to judge. So the bottom line is this. I, 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 I've seen people prophesy or confront stuff like that. Here's the deal, okay? I don't like, I get, I get upset. Maybe it's a righteous indign in, in, uh, indignation, I don't know. When people do this kind of stuff in the flesh, when people are just goofy and strange. I understand that. We need to deal with it. We need to call it out. But here's what I have learned in these last, what, 20 years, 10 years, uh, 10 years of walking through this. I've learned that if I'm going to call out the negative, if I'm going to call out people who are obviously doing stuff in the flesh, behaving goofy in the flesh, I do not want for a moment, for a moment, my trying to pastor people through this and in, in, in certain situations confront them boldly for their behavior. I don't want for a moment to be communicated in a way that would make people think, oh, wow, Larry doesn't, want, Larry doesn't like it when the Holy Spirit moves that way. Oh, please, I, I, if, if I ever say anything, write anything, present anything in such a way where it makes it sound like I don't like, I don't cherish when Holy Spirit moves that way and people get touched in unusual, bizarre, but life-changing ways. Forgive me, Lord. Forgive me, Lord. Because that's not it. I want, to, I, I want to boldly, at times boldly, at times gently, correct where we have the issues, but never at the expense of making it sound like in some blanket statement, in some very angry statement, I don't like it when this kind of stuff happens. Um, I'll never forget at one of the most recent conferences we did with John and Carol. Uh, Johnny, nobody was even praying uh, for, for this person. I don't know what happened. All I know is I walked over to one part of the altar. I've shared this story before. Walked over to this uh, part of the altar in, at Covenant in, in Palm Beach Gardens. And I saw this little girl. I knew the family. The, these were not like woo-woo people. These are very, I mean, these are, these are solid people. These are people who have come to many of our meetings. But they are, I mean, I think they went to the local Catholic church, truth be told. I think that's where their primary church home was. And I, I, I went over to where this mom was with her daughter. Uh, again, solid, stable, trustworthy, beautiful people. And this little girl who had to be seven or eight, I think, 
was, I knew it was pure, it was holy. I, even as I think of it now, I feel the presence of God. This little girl was laying just on the altar. No, no fanfare. Shaking, trembling with a smile on her face. Wasn't scared. I remember sitting there and praying with them for, oh, probably 30 minutes. Because I said, God, it's a sacred thing. I feel it even now. You know why? Because I, I have an eight-year-old. I have a nine-year-old. I'm like, God, mark her this way. It was so pure. It was so precious. You, when you know the people, when you know the people, it changes everything. It's not some fly-by-night, you know. <laughs> it's people that you know. It's people that you've watched. And I watched this little girl shaking, trembling under the power of God. Uh, nobody, this was not psychosomatic. This was not hypnotic. This was not induced. Nobody knocked her down. This is somebody trembling under the presence of power of God. All I could pray over her was, God, may this be an argument one day against the devil. When she's 16 years old, come on, I'm going to go there. When she's 17, when, when everybody her age in her class is going in one direction, when everybody's like wanting to dress a certain way or pursue this or go after this, or I, I don't know, and I'm not trying to be legalistic. I'm just saying at the end of the day, it would be legalistic if there was no encounter. But I, I'm like, God, may this be a standard in her, that it would confront her in this beautiful yet gnawing way all the days of her life that he's real. He is the God who rends the heavens. He is not out there detached, disconnected. He is real. He is real. He does come. He does touch. He is overwhelming. He's God. The miracle, as John Arnott has said many times, the miracle is, is not that we're shaking or trembling or whatever. We should, we should not be off put by that for a moment. The miracle is when God touches us that we don't explode. It's funny, but it's true. So don't, ever, don't prophesy out of anger. Because, man, that could get us into a whole lot of trouble. Number three, last thing, because my, my thing said you have 10% left. So if I go off, I got I to gotta hurry because I don't want my phone to die. <laughs> last thing is... Uh, Self-righteousness. But I mentioned this at the beginning. So the three bad, you, you don't want to prophesy out of these three lenses. You don't want to prophesy out of offense. You don't want to prophesy out of anger. I was just talking about that and how I was angry, primarily at things I didn't understand. You know, angry at the manifestations and angry at goofy people and angry at all that kind of stuff. But you know what? We can't prophesy out of anger. And number three, we can't prophesy out of self-righteousness. And what is this? I just wrote down, we can't prophesy from this perspective. Okay, if this is our perspective, then we really need to get along with God. That's why I wrote the Facebook post that I did recently, honestly. This is where we need some inner healing. Whatever you want to call it, if you don't like the language of inner healing, that's fine. <laughs> if you need a sozo, if you need to go restore some foundations, I love all those ministries. If you need to, you know, I'm just saying, there's some issue in your heart that needs to be dealt with where you believe that I'm the only one hearing from God. I have a monopoly on hearing from God. Now, let me just share very, very briefly. Sometimes you, you do feel a little bit alone. Okay? Sometimes prophetic people, particularly when God is sharing stuff with you, now it's got to be biblical, but I'm just talking about when God is sharing stuff with you, um, and it seems like the, the culture, even the culture of the church, sometimes is going in a different direction. You do feel alone, but surely somebody else. Surely somebody of repute. Surely somebody of integrity. Surely somebody is talking about that. Okay. Because, you know, you, you, me, I mean, if I were in some hole in the wall and I was out there being like, oh God, I'm the only one saying this. I'm like a John, Bap John the Baptist. No, there was only one John the Baptist, okay? I believe what God's doing in this hour, he's raising up a collective of prophets, okay? We might be hearing different things, but it's very, it's vital. Like I, I, tried my best regularly, routinely to pre present, pass off prophetic words that I believe I'm receiving but to other people, like a lot of people, people that I know, people that I trust, people who have much more authority than I do. I'm like, am I hearing the thing? My, my French, Sarah, nice to see you on. <laughs> oh, so I, I, I'm sorry. I haven't even greeted anybody, but Sarah, who else is on here? Sarah and Sherry and Andrew, all, all you guys. So, Anyway, I mean, talking about just prophets and prophetic people, some of the best ones that I know are, are watching, and that's true. So, um, be a self righteousness. This is one, and I've, I've done that. Can, can I be honest? Can I have, hey, Kate, hey, everybody. I have, I'll be honest, in times past, I have been like, well, I'm sharing, I've got this word and I'm the only person. And then you become critical of everybody else. Oh, Chelsea, isn't it? Self righteousness is so ugly. 
so ugly. It's just like blech. I don't know how to say it. Um, but but yeah, uh, see, and uh, Nate and Christy Johnston, Lana Vosser, I love. Man, I don't know what God's doing in Australia, but you know, Sarah, Sarah, Chelsea, what what's going on? Seriously, like all of you amazing people in Australia. Um, I've learned so much. I've learned so much from being around. I, I just got to say this. This might be a word. I hope this doesn't go off, but uh, it, it, it is icky. But I believe the Lord's raising. Oh man, I feel the fire of God on this. So Chelsea. Let me know, Australia people, who's watching right now from Australia. This is the word of the Lord for you. I believe the Lord's raising up a wineskin. He's raising up a blueprint. I don't want to just give you the spiritual charismatic language. He's, he's raising something up that we need. He, he's raising us uh, as an American, as a citizen here in the United States, where I see some of, the, you know, some of the things in our prophetic movement that are a little bit off. I have been to Australia. I've sat at the Australian Prophetic Council. I go there not as a speaker. I go there to listen. I go there to learn why the Lord's raising something up. I just feel he, he's raising up a community of people who prophesy into culture, who are not afraid to address the cultural issues through the word of the Lord. Here, I got to say, sadly, in the United States, when it comes to cultural issues, we want to just like divorce ourselves. The church, particularly the charismatic prophetic church, not all. But, but some, we want to divorce ourselves from the cultural conversation. Why? Because, well, I don't want to present myself as somebody who is tackling political issues or cultural issues. But the reality is the voice of the Lord. The, it's the voice of the Lord that's going to give solutions. And I actually believe, and I can't, I can't go into all this right now, I believe one of the reasons that our land or our nations are polluted Jeremiah, I'm reading the book of Jeremiah right now. He talks time after time this phrase, the pollution of the land. And he, and he correlates the pollution of the land directly to the status of the people of God. What were the people of God listening to in the days of Jeremiah? I'll tell you what they were listening to time after time. Priests and prophet were telling them what they wanted to hear. They, they were, and it might not have, they may not have been, let me say it this way. The priests and the prophet, particularly the prophets, were telling the people what the people wanted to hear, to hear because they had itching ears. They wanted to see, they wanted to hear nice sounding things. The nice sounding things that the prophets were telling them might not have been content wise false, like God is good and all this. But the reality was they were in a crisis in that hour, in that moment, they're in a crisis. And I believe the Lord's raising up a prophetic company, a prophetic community, a prophetic collective out of Australia that's going to show the nations, that's going to actually teach the nations. And I'll just say, you teach me, show me, but that, that will and is teaching the nations on how to address controversial cultural issues with love and truth, hearing the voice and the solutions and strategies of God, and literally speaking right into those things. And I'll tell you why you have authority in that, because of what you've actually been seeing in your nation. You may not have seen full manifestation of certain things, but I can promise you with the prime minister elections, with certain things that have positively happened, certain positive outcomes that have happened in your government and the political system, I can tell you there's fruit. I believe that that is the fruit, that is the manifestation of a prophetic community in Australia, unafraid to get their hands dirty. And I say tonight, Father, help us to get our hands dirty. Help us not to run away from the cultural conversation. Help us not to hide behind our charismatic celebrity. And the reality is we want to call that stuff out. We want to call that stuff out. Um, but we also want to give righteous and, and constructive solutions. I don't want to just get on here and rail against everybody. I guess at the end of the day, I'm finishing up right now. Um, I don't want to be self-righteous and thinking I'm the only one who's right. Everybody else is wrong. That is icky. Somebody gave me a great theological word for that. I saw it in the comments. Icky. That's icky. It's ick. It's awful. When I see those posted on Facebook or YouTube or I hear some, I just, it's like icky. Because the content very well might be correct. But I'll never forget when I was at Bethel Church. It was last fall. The Lord had me outside. I've shared this many times. I'll close with this. I was just talking to the Holy Spirit about the prophetic, and he said, Larry, somebody's content might be right, but their character might be wrong. When I say character, I'm not even talking about that prophetic person not having integrity in terms of character, although God wants that. I'm talking about their character, like the character of the word. The content might be right, but man, if the character of the word is an offended kind of word, if the character of the word is driven by anger, if the character of the word is driven by bitterness and unforgiveness, and if the character word of the word is driven by self-righteousness, then guess what? People won't even listen to the content because like, man, this person's kind of stink. And listen, God is a God who feels. Does that make sense? I, I want to be very careful about that because God feels. 
and God has a righteous indignation. And you know what? There will be times where we deliver words like that. There will be, there, there will be times where words are, are, are delivered with a righteous indignation. And I'm, I'm again, well, I, I believe while I was at Bethel, Paul, you're a Bethel person. I was there. I believe I was just kind of tapping into the wonderful purity of the prophetic culture there, just what God's you know, established there. And I'm, I'm grateful. I'm grateful for what God is raising up. But again, we, we want to make sure that the content is right. We'll make sure the character is right. And we do want to be a prophetic people who don't just use the gift of prophecy for our signs and wonders prophetic conferences. We want to use the gift, the, the, the prophetic ability and acumen that's cultivated in those conferences. We must release that into whatever spheres we're called to, particularly when we're engaging the cultural conversation. Because at the end of the day, no, I don't want to be a cranky prophet. I don't want to be a grumpy prophet. I don't want to be an angry prophet. And I don't want to be an itching ears prophet. I want to be somebody who prophetically hears what are God's solutions. If I got to call stuff out, you know what? I'm going to call stuff out so I can call people in. I want to call people out of stuff, not just so they can feel bad. If you just leave people feeling bad, if you just beat them up with prophetic words. John Bevere had some of the most wonderful, tender things to, to share. If you ever go find an interview with him, because he deals with a lot of hard things, but his heart breaks over the hard things he has to deal with, okay? And plus, he always is offering a prescription, always offering a solution. So that's my encouragement to you. Let's always, l- l- listen, don't water things down. We don't need milk. We don't need just prophecies saying, you're awesome, you're great, all is well. No, no, no. But we need solutions, We need to hear what God is saying so we can actually speak solutions into the chaos, into the crisis, into the issues. And like I said, you know, don't don't do what Larry did. Don't give prophetic words out of offense, out of anger, self-righteousness, thinking, oh man, I'm ill. No, no, we want to we want to do it from the Father's heart. We want to we want to model him. So hopefully this was helpful. Last thing though, very quickly, well, well, all you guys are on here, and I pray that this doesn't die, but um if you've never been to Israel, talking about the prophetic, okay? Next year, going to Israel, I think, I think my wife put up a video. I'm gonna try to, we're gonna try to definitely put up a video as well. Just from our previous trips to Israel, uh, we would love to have you. I'm gonna just keep talking about this. Uh, well, not tonight, don't worry, I'm closing this video. But if you've never been to Israel or as if, if you've been there multiple times, I believe there's a prophetic assignment on our trip to Israel next year, March 2020. We're going to go with God TV, our friends there. Me and my wife, Mercedes, will be helped leading this trip with Robert Henderson, Patricia King, Jamie Galloway, worship leader, Lyndall Cooley. So excited that Lyndall will be there because honestly, one of the songs in my spirit for I don't know how long is that Isaiah 6 song. You know, I, saw, I see the Lord and he's, his train fills the temple that, I, that, that Lyndall sang. I don't know if he wrote it, but he's, he's kind of popularized it. So I'm very excited about that. If you have any questions about the Israel trip, you can certainly um, message me or whatever, but <clears throat> it will be next March 2020. All the details will be god.tv slash Arise Zion 2020. That's god.tv slash Arise Zion 2020. I'll put up some more information about that. But if you've never been to Israel, now is a great time to get kind of arrangements made. It's going to be a prophetic tour. And we are looking forward to God just giving clarity, giving vision, and I believe giving people supernatural encounters that mark their lives forever. So thank you guys for joining. Keep sharing about that, giving details as we go along. Good night. God bless. Talk to you soon.